Hi, my name is Amrita and this is my booktube. It's Tag Tuesday, so of course I'm going to be doing a tag. And this time it's by Lady Jane Books and it's the Finally Fall tag. Now I kind of thought twice about doing this tag because right now, as you can see, I'm in a very tropical environment where there is no hint of fall at all. In fact, I'm currently shooting this video in the middle of a heat wave, so that's nice. But also, I really miss fall and I miss my friends. You know, it's October, November is when I usually find myself in a colder climate somewhere in the world and November is Friendsgiving with my friends and this is going to be the first time in years that I won't be spending it with my friends and I miss them. I haven't seen anybody in like, you know, face to face for about eight months now. I feel like a shut-in and a recluse. And even though I do have introverted tendencies, I love my friends and I love spending time with them. And this year has been just death on that count. And I just feel horrible, basically. So <laughs> I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do this tag, especially when I was watching everybody else do it and everybody looks so cozy and nice and, are clearly having the time of their lives and I am basically golem. And then I fixed my attitude and here I am. Question one. In fall, the air is crisp and clear. Name a book with a vivid setting. So this is actually a novella that I spoke about on my bookstagram and it is The Black God's Drums by P. Jelly Clark who is a really fresh talent in fantasy and science fiction, and he is amazing. This was the first book that, or novella, that I'd read by them, and it is incredibly detailed and vivid. So it's set in New Orleans, um, and it's an alternate history New Orleans. So uh, the Civil War has sort of ended in a stalemate, and the Union has been torn asunder and New Orleans is basically home to a bunch of freed slaves as well as um, people who don't have problems with it. And it sort of works as a conduit between the Confederate States as well as the uh, Union States in addition to a bunch of other people from the Caribbean. And in this particular setting, Haiti has won its freedom from the French and they did it in spectacular fashion. And now the world is sort of on a precipice and people don't really know that or understand that. And it marries African folklore and American history and this amazing cast of diverse characters from all over the world. And it is fabulous. I highly recommend it. Nature is beautiful, but also dying. Name a book that is beautifully written, but also deals with a heavy topic like loss or grief. I might have mentioned this before, but I don't really do, you know, the beautiful, elegant, suffering books. There's a bunch of really personal reasons why um, I just don't react very well to suffering, especially when I'm reading it, because, you know, it just gets in my head so much and I, find myself really spiraling down and I don't need that, especially off late. And over the years, I've just come to sort of approach books like that with caution. And of late, I think I read more nonfiction that is disturbing than I do fiction. And that, weirdly enough, I mean, you'd think that that would be worse because I'm reading about real people going through real things. But for some reason, I find it easier to read nonfiction that is about difficult subjects than to read fiction. It doesn't really make sense, but that's where I'm at. So my pick for this one is uh, called Illiberal India, Gauri Lankesh and the Age of Unreason by Chidanand Rajkata. This is a book about a particular woman who lived and worked in South India and she was an activist and she was a political writer 
and she was fluent in the local vernacular as well as in English, which allowed her to sort of move between classes and therefore between worlds because in India, society can be incredibly classist and divided. And she was able to really translate ideas into both languages and to exist on an intercultural level that made right-wing reactionaries really uncomfortable because she was advocating a more liberal ethos and it ended in her murder and this particular book has been written by her ex-husband who remained her very good friend to the last and who was devastated by her murder and he sort of details her life and her work and the importance of that but also what it means when we murder people like that in a country like ours reading it was difficult not just because it was it was the loss of a truly amazing life one that meant so much for so many people people who don't even realize what it meant to have this woman be alive and working amongst them but also you know he's writing from a place of grief and loss not just for her her loss but also for the loss that we have suffered as a country and in a way this is a story that can translate to so many different countries right now and it's a very indian story but it is also a cautionary tale for many parts around the world i feel fall is back to school season share a non-fiction book that taught you something new my choice for this particular prompt is a book that I read a long time ago and it was a real eureka moment when I read it. But it's called Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, a report on the banality of evil by Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt, for those of you who don't know, is a political writer and uh, I think a theorist as well. And uh, she actually coined the phrase banality of evil, which is something that we use quite a bit. And this particular book is about her going to Jerusalem to witness the trial of one of the most infamous Nazis to have ever been captured. It was originally published in The New Yorker and it became a sensation and then she turned it into a book. And basically she talks about being present at the trial and what she observes. I will say first up that this is a book that came out in the 1960s. So, you know, it's been responded to and written back to and recontextualized over the years. And there's a lot of criticism out there. But the pieces that I've read responding to her are, I don't know, like, I don't think they make their case as persuasively as she does. Um, but even if, you know, you find yourself disagreeing with her. I feel like her book is valuable to read and I'll tell you why it was valuable for me because um, when she's talking about Eichmann and she's talking about the things that he says um, and he's obviously an anti-Semite. There's a branch of thought that says that Arendt actually let him off the hook and didn't believe that he was anti-semitic but i don't think that's true i think she does say that you know he is an anti-semite and he doesn't like jews and he thinks jews should be you know eradicated from the face of the earth but the argument that she makes is that left to his own devices he lacked the drive or the ambition or the intensity to actually go through on direct action and instead, what the Nazis did and what Germany at the time did and what Hitler's government did for people like him was that it allowed him to take a series of actions that were morally reprehensible and he knew were morally reprehensible, but he could sort of negotiate and justify to himself as a lawful action because everything that he did was lawful and was legal in Nazi Germany. And when I was reading that book, I think that's what really hit me because for years when I was thinking about colonialism in India and about things that 
the British imperialists did in India to Indian people and to Indian resources, I always found myself struggling with this idea of presenting those actions within a context that would allow me to point them out to be evil, which they were, but also have to contend with their own words and their own context because these were people who were writing diaries, who were friends with influential people, um, they were lionized back in England and because the English were writing so much of the history of that period and because they were writing so much of the literature of that period, they really managed to portray these people as good people. And so you have that cultural context for coming from England, while at the same time you have the lived experiences of people in India or in South Asia or in other parts of the empire who are able to say, you know, this action was evil. It perpetrated evil and it ended in evil. But at the same time, because you have this other dominant English narrative about these people being good people, how do you sort of balance the two? And when I was reading Arendt, it became so much clearer because when we talk about somebody being a Nazi, we always think about them being thoroughly evil. And what Arendt was able to do was demonstrate that you don't need to be a cartoon villain. You don't need to be an arch villain to do horrible, horrible things and to believe horrible things and to work towards horrible aims. You can just see yourself as a cog in the wheel, somebody who didn't really have a choice other than to follow orders who was just doing what they were asked to do by those in power. The ability to rationalize one's feelings and to rationalize one's actions that resulted in everything unto and including murder is basically what she means by the banality of evil. And that really switched something in my brain because I was like, oh, I see. I now have a framework within which I can discuss these different things. So yeah, that's a book that I highly recommend. In order to keep warm, it's good to spend some time with the people we love. Name a fictional family or household or friend group that you'd like to be a part of. Okay, there are a bunch of different ones that I could mention, um, including the one that I had last week about uh, Lisa Kleypas and uh, the wallflowers who sound like an amazing bunch of women. But I would like to regress back to my childhood because the first friend group that I really wanted to be a part of was The Famous Five by Enid Blyton. They were just such cool kids. They could just go everywhere, do things, eat all this exotic food. I mean, for English people, it's like sandwiches. But for me, it was just like, wait, what? What kind of sandwiches are those? And they solved crime. Amazing. The colorful leaves are piling up on the ground. Show us a pile of fall colored spines. Okay, this is an absolutely insane bunch of titles. I just pulled it at random off my bookcase, but um, I guess that's what this prompt is for, right? Can you see it? This one is called Legendary Connecticut, um, Traditional Tales from the Nutmeg State. And this one is actually a book that was gifted to me by my friend Lauren. We've been friends for like 20 years, almost, I think. A long time but we met in college and I love her and um, if you're watching Lauren hi and um, yeah she gave this to me I thought it made sense you know fall Connecticut this one's called funky Bollywood and it is by my friend Todd and it is gorgeous it's called the wild world of 1970s Indian action cinema um, it's a selective guide and it is so insanely pretty and it has like all these great things in it. Um, 
I highly recommend it. Like if you want like a coffee table book or if you are looking for something fun and unexpected and you have, you know, somebody in your life who enjoys cinema, then you should get this one. Um, it's really fun. Next up is Snakes and Ladders by Geeta Mehta, A View of Modern India. So Geeta Mehta is basically the daughter and sister of some very famous politicians here in India and Snakes and Ladders is basically her providing a sort of behind the scenes look at um, a particular time period of Indian politics and it's full of like gossipy not gossipy, but kind of feels gossipy stories about Indian politicians and it's a sort of throwback into a different world and there are some really great stories in there and it doesn't matter if you don't know who those people are or if you don't follow Indian politics or you don't know anything about India, it's fine. Like these are some really great human stories and um, I really enjoy them. And last up is Madame de Pompadour by Nancy Mitford, who is one of the Mitford sisters. Um, you know, a bunch of really insane English ladies who were everything from like, you know, best-selling novelist to Hitler sympathizer. I honestly don't even remember how or where we got this from. Like, I feel like I grew up with this book, like it's always been in my home and it's ancient, like it's, you know, you can see just how like it's fallen apart, like the thing is broken, like it's just incontestably her best book. Madame de Pompadour is beautifully written in a rapid, nervous, gay and enthusiastic manner which carries the reader through from first page to last. I agree. If you're interested in French royal mistresses, that's a book that you should be reading. Fall is the perfect time for some storytelling by the fireside. Share a book wherein somebody is telling a story. This one has a very obvious choice, but I kind of feel bad sharing it because it is the King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. And the reason I feel bad for sharing it is because um, Rothfuss has been one of those really famous writers battling mental block so um, he has finished the first two books in a proposed trilogy so the books are basically written as the main protagonist recounting stories from his life so the first book is act one the second book is act two and the third book is supposed to be act three and sort of bring everything together but uh, we've been waiting on the third book for like i want to say eight years now maybe longer maybe shorter but a very long time and it's a shame because it's a beautifully written fantasy series i've heard some people say that they don't really care for it and i don't know how far they got into the book because i think if you're like one third of the way through the first book, which is called Name of the Wind, um, it's a really good book to read. Like it's, it does really fresh things with prose and it's not utilitarian like a lot of genre writing can be. You know, it's a beautifully written novel and it tells a story that really captures your imagination. So um, I really like it. I wish he would finish it. But I know he's also battling mental health issues, so I don't want to be one of those people who's just like, what's wrong with you, monkey? Dance, dance, dance for me. Like, I don't want to be that person, but um, also I don't want to be the person that recommends books to you that are incomplete, uh, just in case you're like me and it will bother you for the rest of time. But if it doesn't bother you, you should check it out. The nights are getting darker. Shared a dark, creepy read. I was gonna say that I don't really read dark, creepy things, but the other day I was on Potato Brarian's channel and she described Rebecca as a dark, creepy read. So, you know, sure. But also, like, you know, I have spoken before about Gideon the Ninth, which is my discovery of the year. And I loved the voice. I loved how creepy everything was. And it's lesbian necromancers in space who solve a murder 
Can't get more creepy than that. The days are getting colder. Name a short, heartwarming read that could warm up somebody's cold and rainy day. Okay, for this, I have the perfect book. It's called Pistols for Two by Georgette Heyer, and it is a collection of short stories that she wrote. And um, it's a really great introduction to Georgette Heyer if you've never read her. Some of the stories are like, you know, like, what is the point? And then some of the stories you read and you're like, wow, this is great. Um, and you can kind of see the beginnings of ideas for what would later become full-length novels that she wrote. And they're just really wonderful, funny, short reads, just as the doctor ordered. Fall returns every year. Name an old favorite that you like to return to soon. You know what? I think I want something super trashy. Like ever since I did that video about trashy legends, I've just been thinking about like all these Harold Robbins books and Sidney Sheldon books and you know, like all the stuff that I haven't read in years, but just sort of transport me right back to my teens when I was reading filth basically. So I think I want to read something like that. I think maybe I would like to reread If Tomorrow Comes by Sydney Sheldon. This is the story of Tracy, who's a young woman who has everything going for her, and then she gets framed for an embezzlement and sent to prison where she goes through various traumas. And then when she comes out, she just wants revenge. And she also discovers that she's really good at a life of crime and uh, meets the love of her life that way. Goals. Fall is the perfect time for cozy reading nights. Share your favorite cozy reading accessories. Okay, I don't know why accessories is in double quotes like that, but um, I think wherever I am, irrespective of the weather, there are two things that I absolutely need. One is a pillow. I need to have proper back support because you know you are basically hunched over a book all the time. So you need to have back support and you need to have neck support. That's the secret of my longevity. The next thing I need is a blanket. I love having a bit of weight on me and cue the jokes. But I remember like when weighted blankets became a thing and I was just like, oh my God, this is heaven. But I don't even need a weighted blanket. Like anything will do. Just, you know, another sheet on top of me. That's fine. Just something that lets me cuddle under. Spread the autumn appreciation and tag some people. I think most people have already done this tag, so I don't really have a lot of people to tag. You know, it's almost November, so we're heading solidly into winter territory. But if you're watching this video, consider yourself tagged. For more videos, please hit the subscribe button.